David here with Fig Boot on Pens. Today I have for you a classic pen by Parker. A pen which has been around for a very long time uh, and actually claims to be the world's most sold fountain pen and is beloved by many. And that is the Parker 51. Uh, to begin with, I wanted to thank uh, Matthias, a viewer, who lent me this pen to review. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, discuss a little bit about of the, the history of uh, the Parker 51, cover the parts and features of the pen, talk about what I care for, what I don't care for, show some measurements, some size comparisons, and then provide a writing sample. Uh, now, my last name is Parker, and, and I would really like to find a pen from my namesake company that I just love. Uh, you know, I've tried a number of Parker pens and have just yet to find that one that I think is fantastic. Uh, I own a few, but I've yet to feel a connection with any of them. Now, uh, early in my pen journey, I got a great deal of use out of uh, this Parker Urban. Uh, it was my second pen I ever owned at the time, and, uh, and at the time I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've inked this uh, Urban up, though. Uh, they just actually came out with a revised version of this, so who knows, maybe I'll pick one of those up and uh, do a comparison between those. Uh, today, though, I'm not talking about the Urban. I am talking about the Parker 51. Um, I'm not going to delve into too much history here, but there are literally entire books of information about the Parker 51. Um, Parker first started producing the 51 in 1939, uh, and it was launched to mark the Parker Pen Company's 51st anniversary. Uh, and it stayed in production until 1972. Um, over the years, Parker offered many different variations of the 51. Uh, some were vacuum fillers, some were demonstrators, and many, many other varieties. Uh, just the cap alone had over 20 variations. So let's take a look at the pen. Uh, this is the Parker 51. Uh, now, the, uh, the barrel and section are made from plastic, and the cap on this model uh, is a brand of stainless steel called Lustraloy, I believe. Uh, this one is a little banged up, a little worse for the wear, but it, it still functions just fine. Um, while the uh, production date is uncertain for this specific pen, I believe it dates to the late 1950s. Uh, I could be wrong, though. Some of the earlier models actually had a date stamp on the barrel right around here, uh, but this specific pen does not, so it's at least older than uh, the, the 1940s. Um, when the Parker 51 was first introduced, the, the base model actually had a, a sterling silver cap and retailed for $12.50, which doesn't sound like much now, but if you adjust that for inflation, uh, that equates to a $200 pen. So this was not an inexpensive pen. Uh, it was also offered in a model with a 14 karat gold cap and uh, trim for $50, which equates to around $900 in today's money. Um, it was said that this pen was such a status symbol that in the day that Parker would get large orders for only caps and that people would wear the caps around in their pockets to make folks believe that they were the owners of a very expensive and nice fountain pen. Uh, you know, I guess that made for some awkward situations when someone asked to borrow your pen. Um, you know, we'll start here at the finial, uh, which is black plastic and is a bit pointed. Uh, it transitions into the clip band and the clip, uh, which is a bit on the short side, uh, but it fits the pen well. Uh, the clip itself says Parker and is in the shape of an arrow with, with the uh, fletching surrounding the uh, Parker name and the arrowhead at the end of the clip. Uh, early models of the 51 had a, uh, a blue diamond uh, on the top of the clip to signif uh, signify uh, Parker's lifetime warranty. Uh, the diamond was removed around 1947 due to some laws being passed regulating lifetime warranties for products. Uh, the cap itself has grooves which add a bit of texture to it, uh, and it helps the metal from being overly slick. Um, there is no traditional cap band, but at the bottom of the cap it actually says 1 8th 14 karat gold filled made in the USA. Now. The, uh, the 1 8th is a bit of an odd number to have on the cap, but what it indicates is that 1 8th of the total weight of this cap is gold of the given purity, which in this case is 14 carats. So if you do the math, 1 8th of this cap has 58.3% gold, which is 14 carat, which equates to this cap being uh, about 7% gold. 
Uh, now, this cap is gold filled, which is something different than gold plating. Um, without getting into too much detail, gold plating involves laying a, a very thin layer of gold on top of, the, of what they call a, a support metal, like uh, stainless steel or silver or copper. Uh, and that's done via chemistry or electroplating. Uh, now, gold filling uses a process involving more heat and pressure to apply a much thicker layer of gold to a supporting metal. Um, a layer of gold on a gold filled item can be up to 100,000 times thicker than on gold plated items. Uh, there is a small step down to the barrel, which is straight for a bit, and then tapers down to a rounded end, which actually has a little hole in it, which is too bad because this uh, pen would potentially make a, a decent eyedropper. But with a hole in the end, you can't do that. Uh, the, clap, or the cap slips off, and it's not held on by a snap or anything. It's just held on by friction. And what we have is a hooded 14 karat gold nib. Uh, the nib is hooded to the point where only a very small portion protrudes from the section. Uh, the thought behind this design was that uh, with such a small amount of the nib exposed to air, the chances were reduced that the nib would actually dry up. Um, when it's not hiding in here, the full nib is actually a decent size. It's about 22 millimeters long. Uh, and as you'll see in the writing sample, uh, it is uh, very, very fine. And here's a look at the ebonite feed. The section is smooth, uh, but I really don't find that my fingers slip at all. Um, it is very comfortable to hold, and it reminds me a bit of the shape of the, uh, the Lamy 2000, uh, as far as the section goes, uh, but not quite as steep. Uh, the section is actually long enough that you can comfortably hold it in a number of different positions, whether you like holding it closer to the nib or closer to the uh, barrel. Now, there's a grooved band, uh, which you know, would kind of seem like it should be used for the capping mechanism uh, in order to have the cap snap on, but that's not the case. Um, if you need to fully disassemble the pen, then you unscrew the pen and uh, at that point right there in order to access the nib and the feed. Uh, now, I do feel that there is a, a really nice flow between the section and the barrel. Uh, the barrel twists off and inside we have this aerometric converter. Um, the 51 is designed to only work with this aerometric converter and will not accept any cartridges. Um, apparently around 1960, Parker came out with a model which could use both cartridges and a converter, and it was a complete failure, and they pulled it off of the market rather quickly. Um, the uh, a converter actually has rather lengthy instructions. Uh, it says, to fill, press ribbed bar four times, Wipe front end point down with soft tissue. Use Parker Ink, the Parker Pen Company, made in the USA. Uh, while converters like this are typically not my favorite, um, you know, I did find that this one worked, uh, and it worked well enough to hold a decent amount of ink. Uh, you know, this pen was so popular that they actually ran commercials on television for it. Um, check out this commercial for the Parker 51 from back in 1954. Here within the cap of the all-new Parker 51, you'll find the world's smoothest writing pen point. It's Parker's exclusive new electro-polished point, the point that's made mirror smooth in an electro bath, which dissolves all the microscopic burrs and ridges found on ordinary points. The electro-polished Parker point is the smoothest you ever touch to paper. Try it tomorrow. The beautiful all-new electro-polished Parker 51, world's smoothest writing pen. Now, did you notice what message they were trying to get across? They used a number of common advertising techniques, but two that stood out uh, were the use of technical jargon as well as repetition. Uh, it started talking about uh, electroplating, which is what at the time was a relatively new process for stainless steel. Uh, and the technique uh, to, uh, is to basically uh, use words to confuse and impress customers who've never heard of the process. Uh, but it's thought that if, uh, a, co a company is telling you about a, a term, 
even if it's something you don't understand, then it must be important. Now, in this ad, they actually tell you what electropolishing is, but in general, if uh, a word we don't understand is used in an ad, the tendency is to feel it's a good thing rather than a bad thing. Uh, and then in regard to repetition, uh, within the 30 seconds of the ad, they mentioned electropolishing four times and mentioned the smoothness of a nib another four times. So the message they want to get across is that this pen is, a manufa is manufactured using modern techniques which result in a smooth writing experience. Uh, okay, so much for uh, Marketing 101. So, um, oh, one thing I have to mention is just look at those times. Uh, those times are way too far apart, just saying. Um, you know, I can't imagine we'll get back to the point where fountain pens are advertised on television again. Now, Mont Blanc has uh, occasional campaigns, but those kind of more revolve around their brand as a whole rather than uh, a pen specifically. Uh, maybe in the comments below, let me know what modern pen or, or pen company you'd like to see television commercials for and, and then maybe what those commercials might look like. So did I find a Parker pen, which I love? Unfortunately, I can't say that I have. Now, now don't get me wrong. I think that the Parker 51 is a very good pen, uh, which is well constructed and operates fantastic and has really stood the test of time. Uh, it's not just a very good pen for me. Uh, you know, I haven't really found any vintage pens that, that have clicked yet for me, uh, but I'm still open to that opportunity. And maybe one day I'll find a pen from my namesake company that I will cherish. But, you know, unfortunately, the 51 uh, is not it for me. Uh, the nib is um, a little bit on the fine side, even though I know that they do offer uh, different, uh, you can get different nibs on them and different things done to them. Uh, and like I said, I'm just not a huge fan of the vintage look, but that's just me. Thanks go out to Matthias for the loan of this pen. I greatly appreciate it. I've enjoyed taking a look at this pen and delving into a little background and history of, uh, of, of a classic design and a classic pen. So let's take a look at some measurements, some size comparisons, and then a writing sample. Here we go with some size comparisons for the Parker 51. Uh, first of all, with uh, a couple of other Parkers, here it is with a Parker Vacumatic. Uh, and then here it is with the Parker Urban that I showed earlier. Uh, and then here it is with a Pilot Metropolitan. Then here it is with a couple of pens that you actually might see coming up in some uh, near future reviews, which is a Visconti Wall Street. Then we have a Montegrappa American Dream. Uh, and then something I am excited about that actually just showed up in the mail yesterday, and that would be the Nakaya Decapod Rider uh, Twist Aka Temanuri. So that's something very special that uh, we will definitely see more of later, but uh, that's just some beautiful Arushi work. So here we go with the writing sample for the Parker 51. Um, and that I am assuming that this is a fine nib. Uh, there's really no markings on the nib. You have to take the pen apart to actually see something, but it is a very fine line. Uh, and the ink that we're using today is Mont Blanc. Lucky Orange. Uh, the ink came in this nice little bottle. Uh, I kind of like Mont Blanc's bottle with their, uh, uh, with their snowflake on the top there. Uh, and the, this is what the ink looks like. This is a recent release from them. Uh, and this quickly has become uh, probably my favorite orange. I just think it's a really solid uh, and deep color. Uh, just as some comparisons, uh, here it is next to the Roshizuku Yuyaki. Uh, and then even something like uh, Noodler's Apache Sunset, which kind of has a little more of a peachy feel to, uh, to that orange. Uh, and uh, in regard to a couple of other oranges, uh, here it is with Jeherben Orange Indian, and then also Daimi's Blaze Orange.
but um, of all the oranges I have, uh, I've quickly become a big fan of this uh, lucky orange. So here we go with the rest of the writing sample. Uh, as you can see, it does lay down a very fine line. Um, it is a very stiff nib. Uh, you're not going to get much line variation at all out of this pen. Very, very, very little. Uh, and in regard to wetness, um, it's not the most wet nib. Uh, and so I, I think that's probably one of the, the designs of this was it was mean, meant to be used by the masses. So, you know, if you're writing a check or, or just jotting down a note uh, during the day that for the most part, you don't want to have to think about ink drying and things like that. And so I think that was a consideration when making this pen. In regard to reverse writing, it's very sharp. And there's a bit of hard start at the beginning, but it works. Okay. And then in regard to some fast writing, I found that this uh, uh, the feed keeps up just fine and I haven't had any issues. Uh, and that, uh, you know, for a fine nib, I do find it to, to write fairly smooth. You know, hey, maybe there is uh, something to that uh, electro polishing. So again, thanks to Matthias, for the loan of this pen. Uh, I appreciate it. So thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.